Let's see, it says, and I proceeded to where things were chaotic, and I saw there something horrible. I saw neither a heaven above nor a firmly founded earth, but a place chaotic and terrible. And there I saw seven stars of heaven bound together in it like great mountains of burning fire. So there's a place that's chaotic to, to, to Enoch, right? You'll see later on he shivers when he sees this. But it's chaotic. And the, there's seven big stars as big as mountains bound there because they transgressed God's law. You'll read about it as we go on, right? Mm -hmm. But it's cha a chaotic place. If you compare, just com compare that verse with Enoch 18 verse 13. We read it earlier. Now, let's see. This may be off a little bit. It says, I saw a place which had no firmament of the heaven above or a firmly founded earth beneath it. There was no water upon it, no birds. It was a waste and horrible place. It's talking about the same thing. We read it earlier in Enoch chapter 18, verse 13. Now he's giving us a bit more information. You'll see as we read prophets, a prophet declares something, and a couple of chapters he declares it even more. And as you carry on, he declares it even more. Mm -hmm. He adds to it bit by bit, here a little, there a little. He doesn't declare everything in one chapter. He declares it throughout the whole chapter, the whole book. Right. Okay? So this place we're reading about in Enoch chapter 3 is actually Tartarus. Right? You'll see why. Just carry on. Read verse 4 and 5. Okay. It says, uh, Then I saw for the sin and they and why they are bound and what account they have been cast hither. Then said Uriel, one of the holy angels who was with me and was a chief over them, he said, Enoch, why dost thou ask what and why art thou eager for the truth? These no. are the number. Let me stop there. Sorry, Adrian. Just they will carry on now. So verse 5 now answers verse 3 why I said it's Tartarus. Because Yerio, who is chief over it, tells you that he is in Enoch chapter 20, verse 2, over Tartarus, the best part of earth and Tartarus, right? So where these stars, mighty stars like mountains, angels are lying that are bound are in Tartarus. It's a mm -hmm. place that's got no foundation. It's darkness. It's ever forever uh, condemnation. Right? Right. Okay. Now read verse 6. Uh, let's see. There, uh, these are the number of the stars of heaven which have transgressed the commandment of Yahweh and are, and are bound here till 10,000 years. The time entailed by their sins are consumed. Okay. So they are bound there for 10,000 years. Where are they bound? Verse 3 tells us it's in Tartarus. Because mm -hmm. verse 5 tells us they're under the authority of Yeriel, who is in charge of Tartarus in Enoch chapter 20, verse 2. Okay. I hope you guys are following. I'm just referencing Enoch as we go so we can understand it. Right. Uh, let's see. And then it says, and from thence I went to another place, which was even more horrible than the former. And I saw a horrible thing, a great fire, which burnt and blazed. And the place was cleft as far as the abyss, being full of great descending columns of fire. Neither its extent or magnitude I could see, nor could I conjecture. <laughs> Sorry, Adrian, carry on. Uh, I read it. You want me to reread it? Uh, no, 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 it's fine. I know it. Uh, just carry on the next verse. Uh, then I said, how fearful is the place and how terrible to look upon. And then Uriel answered me, one of the holy angels who was with me, and said unto me, Enoch, wow, why hast thou such fear and affright? And I answered, because of this fearful place and because of the spectacle, the spectacle of pain. And he said unto me, this is the prison of the angels and they will be imprisoned here forever. Okay. So here we see that these stars like mountains are bound for up to 10,000 years. 
it's not the translation doesn't actually say ten thousand years. It just says thousands of years, right? Yeah, but, right, right. So thousands of years, these star-like mountain angels will be bound, but also the fallen angels. But in mm -hmm. Tartarus, they are bound and kept. They are not yet judged. And then you see the second place, which is even worse than Tartarus is, where they will be thrown into with columns of fire. It's a terrible place, according to Enoch. So they are kept in a certain place, which is Tartarus. And then when judgment day comes, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. This is what Enoch is seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. So uh, now because we're going then, on to Enoch chapter 22. Yeah. And thence I went to another place, and a, and he had a mountain and a hard, another place, and he had, this is misspelled here, uh, I'm going to try to read it the way it's supposed to be. And thence I went to another place where he had a mountain and a hard rock, and there was in there four hollow places, deep and wide and very smooth. How smooth are the hollow places and deep and dark to look at? Just hang on, Adrian. Uh, it's raining so hard, yeah, I can't hear anything. <laughs> okay, just, no problem. Open up now. <laughs> no problem. That's good. You probably need the rain, huh? Um, let's see. It's that cyclone that's coming from Mozambique. Yeah, I saw there was bad weather over there. The children of men. Okay, so just read Enoch chapter 22, verse 2 again for me, Adrian. Uh, yeah, it says, uh, and there are four hollow places, deep, wide, and very smooth. How smooth are the hollow places, deep and dark to look at? So, yeah, it's talking about Shul. There are four hollow places. We're going to read it further on in the chapter, what they are for. But just to reference these hollow places, just go to Proverbs 7.27. Okay, and it says, her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Okay, chambers of death, plural. Not one chamber, chambers, plural. Mm -hmm. Solomon is speaking about it. They know this. It's sad right. that the modern day church does not know this. Plural. And Enoch talks about the four chambers, plural, chambers of death. So you see in Proverbs, it speaks about the chambers of death. And then in Enoch, it speaks about the chambers of death. Solomon and them got these chambers and deaths, all of this from the book of Enoch, because it's the only book that explains it. That's yeah. why they mention it. Okay. <laughs> the next verse, verse 3. Uh, then Raphael answered one of the holy angels who was with me and said, The hollow places have been created for this very purpose, that the spirits of the souls of the dead should assemble therein. Yea, all of the souls of the children of men should assemble here. Okay. So these chambers of death spoken about in Proverbs that we read about in Enoch now tells us a thing. This is where the souls of the dead needs to gather. That's where the soul, that's where the soul goes to sleep. The spirit, which is life, returns to the father because there's no more life in you. Right? But the soul has to go to sleep, your consciousness or whatever, what who you are. So here it's giving us a distinction. It's telling us that this, these chambers, is where the dead have to go to sleep. Because they need to await judgment. They even like the fallen angels need to await judgment. It's not judgment day yet, okay? As we right. carry on, you'll see how these chambers play out and how they work. Um, let's see. Uh, then it says, four and, five. and these places have been made to receive them till the day of judgment and their appointed period, till the appointed period, till the great day of judgment comes upon them. I saw the spirit of the dead making suit. And a voice went forth from heaven and made suit. And I asked Raphael, one of the angels who was with me, and I said unto Just him, properly. okay. So verse 4 and 5 tells us that these four chambers or these chambers, right, 
are the place where people need to go rest until the day of judgment day. So it makes it very clear. All souls go and rest until judgment day happens. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that, this is where they go to. Okay, carry on now. I asked Raphael, the angel who was with me, and I said to him, the spirit which is making suit, whose voice goes forth and maketh, maketh suit uh, to heaven. And he answered, saying, this is the spirit which went forth from Abel, whom his brother Cain slew, and makes suit against him until his seed is destroyed from the face of the earth, and his seed is annihilated from amongst the seed of men. Okay, so not to get into your topic of seed and what happens in Genesis, that seed needs to be annihilated from earth according to scripture. But now, yeah, you see that Abel, Cain kills Abel, and Abel in, in Genesis, his blood cries out from the earth. It doesn't cry out from the earth where the blood is lame. The, the, the soul lives in the blood, the spirit, right? He's in yeah. Shul crying out. So mm -hmm. you see this happening in Genesis 14. Right, let's quickly go read that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let me start. I'll start in verse 9. It says, And then Yahweh said unto Cain, Where is thy brother Abel? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Okay. From the ground. From where? It's from these chambers. Mm -hmm. Now we know where. If you read Genesis 14, you think it's just the, the blood that's lying on top of the ground crying out. But it's not. Enoch tells you where it is. It's in these chambers that scripture speaks about, right? It's in Shul where he's resting. Right? Yeah. Because it's innocent blood that's been spilled. And then just right. go to Revelation. Mm -hmm. We're going to reference Revelation chapter 6 quite a bit because it's in the end times. You'll see that these people in these chambers, the innocent ones, they continually crying out to, to the Most High, when are you going to revenge us? And he says, just wait a little while. right? And, I, uh, uh, and white robes were given unto every one of them, and he said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were killed, should be fulfilled. Should Just I start in 10? Before, they crying out, right? Yeah, it says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Yahweh, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Okay. So where are they crying from? They're crying down from Shul, in these chambers that we read about in Enoch and in, in Proverbs, right? Mm -hmm. We still don't know how many chambers it's going to reveal it there, but we know it's more than one chamber. And they are divided. So right. here we see Enoch describing Revelation. And also later on you'll see in this chapter what the Messiah said. Mm -hmm. okay? So the Messiah is quoting right out of this chapter as well. As we carry on, you'll see. Okay, So okay. the blood calls from Shul. It's not just lying on the ground like we read in Genesis. Yeah, and Enoch it tells you where it's calling from, where the cry is coming from. Uh, let's see. When, uh, I think we were in. I think you're wanting me to pick up in verse eight, but mine says six. Uh, let me start. Yeah. I'll just tell me if I'm off or not. It says, "Then I asked regarding it and regarding the hollow places, why is one separate from the other?" And he answered me and said unto me. These three have been made that the spirits of the dead might be separated, and such a division has been made for the spirits of the righteous, in which there are is a bright spring of water. Okay, and just hang on. Okay. In verse eight, it says these three have been these chambers have been separated from the other, meaning right. three chambers are separated from one. So now right. we're looking at four chambers. Just read verse 8 again, or your verse 6, because yours doesn't say three there. Then I asked regarding it, and regarding the hollow places, why is one separate from another? And he answered me and said unto me, These have been made for the spirits of the dead, that they might be, uh, that they might be separated. For such a division has been made, for the spirits of the righteous in which there is the bright spring of water. Okay. 
In verse 9 it says, These three have been separated from the one, and they're all separated from each other. But right. there are three chambers, and then there's one. So in total, you'll be looking at four chambers of Shu, right? Mm -hmm. So now these chambers that we're reading about that are separated is spoken about, you can go to Luke. Because remember, we just read in one of them, there's a fountain of spring and light. Okay. Mm -hmm. Luke chapter 16, verse 23 to 26. <clears throat> and in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment and and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime received all the good things and likewise Lazarus the evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art in torment. Okay, so uh, here we're seeing the Messiah using a parable that is spoken about of in Enoch, right? Yeah. Where does Lazarus stay? Lazarus is in, the, in, in one chamber, and there are three chambers that separating him. But in this case, he's speaking about one. There's a deep valley between them that separates the two chambers. But in the one that Lazarus is, is the spring of water where you must dip your finger into and put on his tongue. So he's yeah. not in the same chamber as Lazarus. So we see... How we said earlier in Enoch chapter 22, verse 2, and we referenced it with Proverbs 7, 27, chambers, plural, not one, but plural. There are four chambers in total. Yeah. Let me read uh, 26 as well. It says, and besides all of this, between us is a great gulf fixed, so that which would pass from hence to you cannot neither can it pass to us that it would come from thence. So this is speaking about the division between the chambers like Jason's talking about right now. Okay. So in Shul, not all the dead lay together. The dead know nothing. They can't do right. anything. They can't have any effect on them. They are there asleep in their spiritual sleep, if you want to call it that. But they know nothing. They can't do anything. They can't communicate. They can't, they can't do anything. But there's chambers dividing because the righteous are waiting righteous judgment. They know they have to be erected to eternal life. They are crying righteous plea. And mm -hmm. the others are saying, yes, if we have just listened, if we have just listened to the Messiah and the prophets, we would also be where you are and we'll have the a spring of water, the fountain of life with us and the eternal light, right? Like we read on Enoch. And then right. this Lazarus tells him, no, you, you had the prophets and Moses and all of them. How would they listen to an angel if they can't listen to Moses and the prophets? Okay. Remember, this is a prophecy for last days that we are reading. So, as we carry on, you'll see how it plays on. Okay, so read verse 10 now. Uh, okay, it's, uh, Here the spirits shall be set apart in this great pain till the day of judgment and punishment and torment of those who curse forever and the retribution for the spirit there. Read he one shall... verse before you skip one. Oh, I skipped one. All right. Um, and such a division has been made for the spirits of the righteous, in which there is the bright spring of water, and such has been made for the sinners when they die and are buried in the earth, and judgment has not been executed on them there in their lifetime. Okay. Carry on. Here... Their spirits shall be set apart in this great pain till the great day of judgment and punishment and torment of those who curse forever and the retribution for their spirits. There, uh, see, this is all messed up. Uh, he shall bind them forever, for such a division has been made for the spirits of those who make their suit, who make disclosures concerning their destruction when they were slain in the days of the sinners. Okay, just go back up to verse 11, just read that and stop. Here their spirits shall be set apart in this great pain till the great day of judgment and punishment and torment of those who curse forever and retribution for their spirits there. Okay, they will be bind there 
and and it's torment for them. Remember what happened with, with this Lazarus? It's torment for the other guy calling Lazarus. Mm-hmm. He's so thirsty, he, he, he can't even do anything. Begging him to just take a drop of water and put it on his tongue. That's torment, but it's not judgment yet. It's not a nice place to be, but it's not not the fire yet. That fire still comes, right? That happens on judgment day. Just like we read earlier with Tartarus and the angels. You see the angels kept in a certain place prepared for them. And then when judgment happens, he talks about the fire. So right. this is not talking about hell yet, as people would say today, hell or the place of fire or the lake of fire yet. It's just where the souls are kept in rest. So they will be kept there. So just reference that with Psalm 146 verse 4. Psalm 146 And it says... His breath goeth forth, he returneth to the earth in the day of his thoughts perish. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Sorry. Okay. Just read it again slowly so we can see. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Okay. He's returning. So if you read verse 11 in Enoch now, you'll understand. If you read Psalm in a bit more context, his thoughts perish. In that day, is nothing. He goes to one of these chambers, right? Right. And then just go to um, Lamentations. Okay. 9.5. 9? Nine, uh, Lamentations. Uh, it only goes to uh, five chapters. Um, yeah, I don't know what it is. It's Predaker. I don't know what that is in English. I think it's Lamentations. Predaker uh, is... Is it Proverbs, maybe? Yeah, no, uh, that's Priyaka. Ecclesiastes, maybe? Yeah, let's try Ecclesiastes. Uh, what was it again? Chapter what? Nine five. Nine five. Um, yeah, that's probably it for the living know that they shall die, but the dead not know not anything, neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Okay, so let's read verse 11 again. Okay, um, it says, here their spirits shall be set apart in this great pain till the day of judgment and punishment and torment of those who curse forever and the retribution for their spirits there. Okay. They are there, they did, they done nothing, and they are reserved <coughs> in a place which is one of these chambers in Shul that is waiting judgment day. Okay. No one is in heaven. No one can go to heaven until judgment day is done. And you're not going up to heaven. The heaven's coming here. Right. Okay, just for those who don't know this. Okay, carry on reading verse 12. He shall bind them up forever, and such a division has been made for the spirits of those who make suit, who make disclosures concerning their destruction when they were slain in the days of the sinners. Okay. They are making suit. Remember what we read earlier in in Revelation 6? Verse mm-hmm. 19 and 11, they are making suit. They are making lamentation to God. When are you going to revenge our blood? We've been killed innocently. And he says, stay a little while until your other brothers are also martyred. And then I will come. The cup of iniquity needs to flow over with blood before the Messiah can come. Yep. So this is why he says, just wait a little while, right? And mm-hmm. if you just cross-reference what you just read there with um, um, Enoch chapter 9 verse 10. Uh, let me see. I got to try to line this up here. Uh, and the women and the women have bore giants and the whole earth has thereby been filled with the blood of the unrighteous. Is Now, that's not verse. Yeah, that's it. Filled with the unrighteous. And now, behold, the souls of those who have died are crying and making suit to the gates of heaven and their lamentations have ascended and cannot cease because of their lawless deeds which are wrought on the earth. Okay. 
These souls are making lamentations. They are crying because they were killed by the descendants of angels. Right. Right? Remember, we read it now in Enoch. They did it in Enoch. It tells us in Enoch chapter 9 verse 10. They are killed because they were killed by the descendants of angels. Right? If you follow that logic, Cain killed Abel. Who was crying out from the earth? Abel did. Who killed him according to Enoch? Cain. Serpent seed. Descendants of angels. Yeah. Right. Satan was an angel, if you don't know that. Yep. Okay, verse 13. Uh, let's make it back. Let's see. Such has been made for the spirits of men who were not righteous, but sinners who were complete in their transgression and the transgressors, they shall be companions, but their spirits shall not be slain in the day of judgment, nor shall they be raised from thence. Okay, so such places has been made for good and bad spirits. That's why there are four chambers. They are separated. <clears throat> you will see later on in Enoch as we read how these chambers are separated, or maybe we've read it, I'm not sure, how they are separated and why they are separated. For example, there's one chamber where when people go to that certain chamber, let's call it the fourth chamber, for example. If certain people go to the fourth chamber, they have no audience on Judgment Day. They have put judgment on themselves. They just get thrown into a lake of fire. They can't, cannot make a case at all. Judgment right. has been on themselves. This is where scripture comes in and it says, don't heap the coals on your own head. For the tray that's holding the coals, these burning hot coals on your head, might get to heaven, uh, too heavy and fall and you burn yourself. You've put yep. judgment on yourself. Very okay, true. Carry on. Then I blessed the Lord of glory and said, Blessed be my Lord, the Lord of righteousness, who ruleth over forever and ever. Okay. So Enoch chapter 22, verse 10 and 11, right, is answered in verse 13. So if you read verse 10 and 11, you want to know the answer, go read verse 13. That's the summary of what we just read in Enoch. These chambers, sure, not one chamber, but four. Right. Very interesting. All right. Okay, chapter so we're 20. going to do Enoch chapter 23, 24, and 25, Adrian. Okay. Then you'll see Enoch chapter 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. We won't do. We'll skip that. We can only do that when we get further on in Enoch. Because if I do that, I have to reference the front of Enoch. Right. Uh, the, yeah. the last back of Enoch. I don't want to do that. So just yeah, remember, know. when we get there, I'll tell you to make a note. And we'll come back as we go on to Enoch. We'll come back to these chapters. Yeah, that's a good okay. idea. All right. Uh, chapter 23. <clears throat> From thence, I went to another place to the west of the ends of the earth. And I saw a burning fire which ran without resting and paused not from the course day or night and ran regularly. And I asked, saying, what is this which rests not? Then Ragwell, one of the holy angels who was with me, answered and said unto me, this course of fire thou hast seen is the fire in the west which, which persecutes all of the luminaries of heaven. Okay, why is it Ragwell and why does he answer here? To find that answer, go to Enoch chapter 20, verse 4, and read mm -hmm. what Ragwell's, that angel's purpose is. One of the holy angels who takes vengeance on the world of the luminaries. <clears throat> okay, where this fire, fiery place is seen is a place that's persecution for the luminaries, like we read earlier, Tartarus, right? Mm -hmm. This so the, the, the luminaries are like mountains laying in a certain place, just like Shul, but not Shul. And when judgment day comes, they're going to go to this place of fire. Right? Right. This is why Ragwell is answering. That. This is where the lights will be prosecuted. Okay? That's my 23 finished. It's a okay. short piece on my book, but I don't know on yours if it carries on. No, that was it. Okay, verse 24. <clears throat> All right. 
Um, let me just highlight it so I don't lose my spot here. All right, it says, And from thence I went to another place of the earth, and he showed me a mountain range of fire that burnt day and night. And when I went beyond it, I saw seven magnificent mountains and all different, differing each in, from the other. And the stones thereof were magnificent and beautiful, magnificent as a whole of glorious appearance in fair exterior. Uh, three, three towards the east, one on either side, three towards the south, one upon the other, and deep rough ravines not one which joined with another and the seventh mountain was in the midst of these and excelled them in height resembling the seat of a throne and fragrant fragrant trees encircled the throne okay so yeah you're seeing a bunch of mountains but one mountain that's resembling the seat of a throne right so just carry on reading the whole chapter 24. We'll go back and reference it. I just want you to see the context. And amongst them was a tree such as I had never yet smelled. Neither was any amongst them, nor were other like it. It had a fragrance beyond all fragrance, and its leaves and blooms and wood wither not forever. And its fruit is beautiful. And the fruit resembles the dates of a palm. Then I said, how beautiful is this tree and fragrant and its leaves are fair and its blooms very delightful in appearance. Then answered Michael, one of the holy and honored angel who was with me and was their leader. Okay. So yeah, you see <clears throat> mountains, right? And one mountain resembling the throne. And he's asking Michael what it means. We'll get the answer now. But, he, but he's seeing this, tree, uh, this mountain and with the mountain streams and, uh, and trees and one tree, especially one whose fragrance is beautiful for him to smell. And it's got good fruits on it. And it's good to eat, it says, right? Like we read in Genesis 2, 9. It's good to eat. It's nice. It's a good fragrance. Quickly go to, to um, Isaiah 6, 1. Okay. <clears throat> says in the year that king uzziah died i also saw the lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple okay he's seeing this throne high and lifted up a mountain between other mountains that's above them but realize when you read Revelation, there are many thrones. There's thrones for the 144, but there's one throne of God. Right. But in Revelation, it tells you the throne of God, and then it tells you the Messiah goes, sits on the throne. On what throne is the Messiah sitting? It's one of the other mountains surrounding this main throne, this one in the center. There are many thrones. Mm -hmm. Why are there many thrones? Because of this. Bear with me now. There are 144,000 that will be bought, bought free from this earth. Of the 144,000, it's 12,000 of each tribe. The tribes were situated north, south, east, and west, right around the tabernacle. The throne of God has got mountains around it, north, south, east, west. On each mountain sits three tribes. And these tribes will sit on these thrones with the Messiah and rule and judge world, nations and angels according to Scripture. But there's one throne that we cannot sit on. This is the throne of him that is greater, of them, greater than his son, the Messiah, the one that sent his Messiah. So here in Enoch, it's giving you the picture of the thrones and what they look like. They are compared to mountains because they are sizable and mountains are also compared to nations. Mm -hmm. So just bear with me what we read here now. So, and then in Genesis, it, it also talks about this tree of life. But here you see that this tree of life is with this throne. It's not far off. It's close to the throne. Okay? So now we're going to find the answer for Enoch 20, chapter 24. We're going to find in Enoch chapter 25 verse 3. Because Enoch is now asking. He's asking Michael, 
what is this? What am I seeing? What am I observing? Because this tree is so beautiful. These thrones are so huge. These mountains are thrones. Okay, let's carry on. Um, and he said unto me, Enoch, why is, do thou ask regarding the fragrance of the tree, and why doest thou wish to learn the truth? Then I answered him, saying, I wish to know everything, but especially about this tree. And he answered, saying, This high mountain which thou hast seen, whose summit is like the throne of Yahweh, his it is sorry, his throne, where the Holy Great One, the Lord of glory, the eternal King, will sit, and he shall come down to visit the earth with goodness. Okay, so here he's confirming that these mountains are the thrones. Okay, there's no doubt of it. There is right. not just one throne. There's one throne of our Father in heaven. No one else can sit on that throne. No one is worthy. He's the creator of all. Then there are other thrones. Remember what we read earlier? There are other mountains around this main mountain. They are also thrones. They are the throne of the Messiah that will be shared with 144,000. There are many thrones according to Revelation. This is what it's talking about here in Enoch. It's, it's trying to describe it to you in prophetic speech. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> I don't know if we should cross-reference Apocrypha. Let's just, just try and stick to cross-referencing normal 66 canon Bible because you can yeah. cross-reference the King Ezra too. Okay, so <clears throat> just read verse 3 again and then we'll cross-reference that. <clears throat> said, then I answered him saying, I wish to know everything but especially about this tree. And he answered saying, this high mountain which thou hast seen, whose summit is like the throne of Yahweh, is his throne, where the Holy Great One, the Lord of glory, the eternal King, will sit when he comes down to visit the earth with goodness. Okay. Just go to Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 2. <clears throat> <clears throat> says in the visions of of Yahweh brought he me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which was the fame of all the city on the south which was the okay. frame sorry this, this very high mountain Mount Zion is the throne it's called the throne of the most high you'll realize that the Messiah comes down with 144 on this throne and from below that throne, they will st will go out the law and the testimony, or the living waters, the rivers, right? Mm -hmm. These rivers are seen as, they have two things in the book of Enoch. I think it's pollen and nectar, yeah. law and witness. We'll see as we carry on. Just go to Daniel. Okay. Chapter <laughs> 7, <clears throat> verse 13 to 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Okay, so when, you, when we read Enoch and we see that the mighty one will come down on, the, on his throne, there it's talking about Yahweh, it's not the Messiah. The Messiah comes down first. He prepares God's bride for him, and when he hands the kingdom back, then God will tabernacle with us once again, like Scripture says. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then go to Luke 1, verse 32 to 33. And it reads, <clears throat> he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And Yahweh shall give him the throne of his father, David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. In his kingdom, there shall be no end. What must the Messiah do? According to prophecy, 
He must go sit on the throne of his father David and rule and judge over the 12 tribes of Israel. The great gathering, all nations gathering and the goats being separated from the sheep. That mm -hmm. needs to happen first before God can tabernacle with us again. Right. No unholiness can be in God's presence. Right? He's going to clean and purify the bride. But here's the thing. You'll see that he doesn't do it alone. He does it with his iron scepter, the 144. Mm -hmm. Okay? <clears throat> Let's read the next verse, Adrian and Enoch. Okay. Um, that scripture we just read was Luke 1, verse 32 to 33. Um, just for the people in the comments, this is a teaching for you guys. So if we're going too fast, just slow us down, please. I can't even see the comments because of the ref I mean, I'm Vaguely can, but um, I can't see it because of my screen. Uh, if we are going too fast or we, you're missing a scripture, let me just ask the people in the comments. Just put a hand up, like a, a high five hand or something. Just say stop, whoa. Not two hands that say blessings, just one hand. So we know and we can see. Okay, so now we're in Enoch chapter 25, verse 4. Yeah. Uh, and as for this fragrant tree, no mortal is permitted to touch it until the great judgment, when he shall take vengeance on all and bring everything into its consummation. No mortal is allowed to touch this tree until when? Until the great judgment. Because to touch this tree, you have to have a right to it. You can't just go into You have to work for it. It's a right. You must have a right to the tree of life. Right? Just go to Revelation 22. <clears throat> just read verse 2. In the midst of the street... Of it, on either side of the river, there was a tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Okay. The healing. Remember the scripture tells us that he will come and he wipe out tears off and we'll have no more pain. We'll jump and skip like goats, like yep. sheep. This will be the healing. Just read verse 14 also. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Okay. In Enoch, it tells us no one is permitted to touch this tree until judgment has happened. And then Revelation tells us exactly the same thing. But Revelation gives us more. It says you must have a right to the tree of life. It's not just freely given. Those yep. who keep the commandments have the right to the tree of life. Their tears will be wiped off their faces. They will be healed by the fruits of the tree. You'll see that getting answered as we carry on. They will skip and jump like, 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 like lambs. They will be happy. They will be a rejoicing again. But no one can get to that tree. You have to have a right to it. You have to have yep. worked for it. The people say you can't work for your salvation. Huh. People, I can't, pe I can't people, people deny this uh, book and it's mind blowing to me. Okay, let's read verse 5 and 6. All right. Um, he shall take vengeance on all oh, until it's consummated. Uh, let's see. It shall be given to the righteous and the holy. Its fruit shall be for food for the elect. It shall be transplanted to the holy place, to the temple of of the Lord, the eternal King. Then shall they rejoice with joy and be glad. And in that holy place shall they enter and its fragrance shall be in their bones as they, as long as they shall live on the earth, such as the fathers lived and their days shall no sorrow or plague or torment or calamity touch them. Uh oh, we lost them.
So hey, about that. No problem. I'm going to reread it really quick. Yeah, just read verse 5 and 6 and stop quickly. <clears throat> okay, it says, um, It shall then be given to the righteous and the holy. Its fruit shall be for the elect, and it shall be transplanted to the holy place, to the temple of Yahweh, the eternal king. Then, wait. I just hang I on, think, Adrian, Chris. Yeah, I don't think that was right. Um, Chris, the last scripture we read was Enoch chapter 25, verse 4, and we referenced it with Revelation 22, verse 2, and Revelation 22, verse 14, where you must have right to the street, because Enoch says no one can touch it until judgment day. Judgment day happens, then you can have eat this fruit, and this fruit will heal you. Okay? But I'll Enoch will explain it later on. So I hope you got that. Uh, let's see, I'm going to uh, pick up at six. Then shall they rejoice with joy and be glad in the holy place they shall enter and the fragrance shall be in their bones and they shall live a long life on the earth such as their fathers lived and their days shall no sorrow or plague or torment or calamity touch them. Okay. So here it tells you, in Enoch chapter 5 and 6, in Enoch chapter 4, it tells you no one can touch the tree. Then Revelation tells us you must have right to the tree of life. And then Enoch tells us you're going to eat from this fruit and it's going to heal your bones, right? So let's just just jump for me to Isaiah chapter 35. Okay. Verse 6 and 7. <clears throat> then shall the lame man leap as as in heart and the tongue of the dumb sing for in the wilderness shall waters break out streams in the desert and the parched ground shall be a pool and the in the thirsty land a spring of water in the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes okay we will jump and skip and sing. Why? Because from Zion comes the law and the testimony. And we would have right to the tree of life and eat the fruits. Mm -hmm. And we will be healed. We will be skipping and jumping like lambs. Our tears will be wiped off our faces. Okay? <clears throat> then just go to Exodus 23 verse 25. Um, this is not a Trinity discussion, but you're welcome to join the live afterwards and come and show me how Jesus is God. And you <laughs> shall serve the Lord your God, and you shall bless thy bread and thy water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. We will bless the Lord our God, and he will give us waters and blessings, and he'll take sickness away from me. We'll skip like lambs. We will no longer be the afflicted. We will no longer be the tail, but the head, the curses of Deuteronomy 28. Right? Amen. Verse 7. Keep thee far from a false matter and innocent and righteous. Slay thou not. I will not justify the wicked. Revelation 22 verse 2. <clears throat> In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was a tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were the healing of the nations. Okay. Enoch chapter 7, this tree is given to the righteous, those who have right to the tree of life. Right. This is what Enoch chapter 25 verse 7 is talking about. So you'll see mostly what we're referencing now is end days revelation, right? And it's all throughout the prophets. Okay, so Adrian, yeah, I'm going to have to reference the last books of Enoch. So I'm going to skip chapter 26, chapter 27, chapter 28, chapter 29, chapter 30, chapter 31. We're going to do chapter 32. Just make okay. a note. But as we get to the end of Enoch, so we can come back and answer these chapters. You can't answer it without reading the back of Enoch. Okay, so we'll just we'll pick back up in verse 26, and we're starting in 32, you said? 
Yes. Okay. Well, you know what? I think let's just go and read them all. We won't cross-reference them yet. Let's okay. just go read them all. And then by 32, we'll start cross-referencing because we can only cross-reference them once we're in the end of Enoch. You will know, see why. Yeah, let's. We'll, we'll, I'll read through them, but we won't. Let's just not break them down at all. Um, we'll just leave them. That way, there's not a, a spot that's empty. All right. Uh, ver, uh, chapter 26. And I went from thence to the middle of the earth, and I saw a blessed place in which were trees and branches abiding and blooming. Uh, of the dismembered tree and there I saw a holy mountain and underneath the mountain to the east there was a stream and it flowed towards the south and I saw towards the east another mountain higher than this and between them a deep and narrow ravine and in it ran a stream underneath the mountain and to the west thereof there was another mountain lower than the former and smaller in elevation, and a ravine deep and dry between them, and another deep dry ravine was at the extremities of the three mountains, and all of the ravines were deep and narrow, being formed out of hard rock, and trees were not planted upon them. And I marveled at the rocks, and I marveled at the ravine, yea, I marveled very much. Verse... Okay. So just a quick summary of what we are reading. Remember okay. Shul and the cavities between mm -hmm. Shul. Okay. And then you'll see from some of the mountains rivers go. Because the, the gospel is being said from the rivers are all from one mountain from the center of the Mount Zion. Right. The law and the testimony will flow. But there are other mountains that are ravines and cliffs. You can't get to them. They are blinded by God. Nations. Hang on a second. I'm just if if there's people in the comments, guys, that are disturbing anyone, please just mute them. Uh, we don't we're not de we're not dealing with that today. If people have questions, that's fine. But I've seen the same. I can hardly see the screen, and I see the same thing popping back up over and over again. Sorry, Jason. No problem, man. Um. Okay. Let's see. Chapter twenty-seven. Then said I. For what object is this blessed land, which is entirely filled with trees, and this accursed valley between? Then Uriel, one of the holy angels who was with me, answered and said, This accursed valley is for those who are accursed forever. Here shall be the accursed be gathered together, who utter with their lips against the Lord, unseemly words of his glory and speak hard things here shall they be gathered together and here shall their place of judgment be in the last days there shall be upon them a spectacle a spectacle of righteous judgment in the presence of the righteous forever here Great shall story. the mercy sorry here yeah, you see playing out more explanation of Enoch chapter 22 and the tunnels and the cavities between the tunnels. Now you see one of the tunnels, it's explaining one of the tunnels. He's asking um, Ragwell, what is the purpose of this cavity? And then he's answering him, saying, here are the accursed, right? It's telling you about judgment for them. One of the tunnels, right? So we've right. read it, if you read this, I can actually only explain it with the end of Enoch, but I don't want to jump ahead of ourselves. But if you cross-reference this with Enoch chapter 22 in the four chambers, you find your answers also. Okay, carry on. In the last days, there shall be upon them a spectacle of righteous judgment in the presence of the righteous forever. Here shall the merciful bless the Lord of glory, the eternal King. In the days of judgment over the former, they shall bless him for the mercy in accordance with which he has been assigned, which he has assigned them their lot. Then I blessed the Lord of glory and set forth his glory and lauded him gloriously. Uh, okay. Chapter 28. Go ahead. No, it's fine. It's not, it was not just describing one of the tunnels. Right. Um, let's see. This is a, these next, Three are very short. They're just a sentence long. Uh, and then I went towards the east in the midst of the mountain range of the desert, and I saw a wilderness 
and it was a sol- it was solitary, full of trees and plants and water gushed forth from above, rushing like a copious watercourse which uh, flowed towards the northwest, and its clouds like dew ascended on every side. Um, uh, from where is this coming? This wind is coming from where? The wind? Yeah. Or the dew? Yeah, it's coming from the northwest. No, 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 verse 1. Oh, sorry, the, uh, the east. Where? Yeah, yeah, the east. I went towards Who the east. From? The Messiah. Okay. Verse 29. Oh, chapter uh, 29. And thence I went to another place in the desert and approached to the east of this mountain range. And there I saw aromatic trees exhaling the fragrance of frankincense and mirth. And the trees also were similar to the almond tree. <coughs> These trees, I don't want to give it away because I need to reference it with our Bible, but especially with the end of Enoch. You know, These trees are the trees that you guys are watching on the live now. You're watching the tall trees standing up, brother Adrian, um, all of these guys. That's why I call them tall trees. They have certain fruits that they bear. They are the trees that stand on the shoreline and cast their nets to Engedi and, and Engliam, Ezekiel. Oh, so right. you'll see how it is answered. We have these tall trees waking up south of the rivers of Kush. Mighty men, one of them spoke and gave a teaching today. His name is Yapi Pansail. These tall trees, if you have spiritual eyes, you see them standing head and shoulders above the others. Okay? Uh, chap- chapter 30. Uh, and beyond these, I went afar to the east and saw another place, a valley full of water, and therein was a tree, the color of fragrant trees such as the mastic. And on the sides of those valleys, I saw new fragrant cinnamon, and beyond these, I proceeded to the east. Still talking about the trees and the trees. They are all gathered around the tree of life. Why? Because they had the right to the tree of life. They were preaching the Torah of the Messiah that he brought. Because we forgot to keep it. Mm-hmm. We were divorced. The Messiah comes and he gives us the Torah again. Now you have to have the right of the tree of life. These tall trees are the people you looking watching on the lives today. And these people speaking truth. Speaking about them, people, you'll see later on if we cross-reference this, what I mean. Um, Chapter 31. And I saw other mountains, and amongst them were groves of trees that flowed forth from the nectar, which is named Sarah and Galabium. And beyond those mountains, I saw another mountain to the east of the ends of the earth, wherein were aloe trees, and all the trees were full of uh, stacked, stacked, being like almond trees. And when one burnt, it smelled sweeter than any fragrant odor. Okay. In verse 31, remember I told you earlier that the Messiah comes on Mount Zion with 144,000, the tall trees. Once he comes and from Mount Zion will go out the law and the testimony. See what he calls that. It's a nectar that's called two things. Go look up the translation for your own uh, uh, sakes. But from these mountains, these 144 go forth the river of life, the Torah. They preach it. It's called nectar. It's got a very beautiful smell. Right? Our prayers are a beautiful smell to God. It's an incense. Yeah. Right. This is what he's talking about here. For those who do not know scripture, he's not talking about a physical mountain here. Mountains are nations. So it says, in this mountain he found tall trees. In these nations he found tall trees. It's a remnant that's waking up. Mountains are nations. Mountains are thrones. Depending on what context he's speaking in, tall trees are people. Do not harm the green plants or trees until I've put my mark on them, the people. Revelation, right? Mm -hmm. These trees are waking up and they are giving from them flowing rivers uh, rivers of living water. What is the living water according to Scripture? The Torah and the testimony of the Messiah. These are these trees that he's speaking about. Prophetic speech. 
Okay, so now this is where we're going to actually pick up, right? In uh, 32? Yes, sure. Okay. It says, uh, and after these fragrant odors, I looked towards the north over the mountains, and I saw seven mountains full of choice nod and fragrant trees and cinnamon and pepper. And thence I went over the summits of all of these mountains far towards the east of the earth and passed above the Ethereum Sea and went far from it and passed over the angel Zotiel. Okay. It's just interesting to note they passed over the angel Zotiel. Why? Because every angel has a task. You get an angels over 100, angels over 50, angels over 10, and so on yeah. and so forth, and above them an archangel. Always seven archangels, and they are over always over 150 and 10. That's how it works. That's the armies of Yahweh. And this angel they pass over is Zutil, because he's got certain tasks to do in heaven. Each angel has tasks. Some open the chariots for the sun and moon. Some, some has to do with the stars. Some control the winds. Some control the waters and the waves. So they control it by God's instruction, because God controls everything. God gives the command and the angel does it. It's called agency. Right? So just note this angel. We'll see why later on. Just highlight okay. it. Because it's very interesting. Yeah, it's I, I think it's probably I read it, but I skipped over it before. Um, let's see. <clears throat> and I came to the garden of the righteous, and from afar off trees more numerous than these trees a great two trees there very great beautiful glorious and magnif magnificent are and the tree of knowledge whose holy fruit they eat and know great wisdom that's awesome they are eating from this tree and they have got lots of knowledge and wisdom remember you must have right to the tree of life yeah okay that's it very, that's very interesting. What's the? Uh, I I I thought I saw something though. I, uh, hold on one second. I'll be with you now. Uh, trees. Yeah, this. Uh, far off trees, more numerous than these trees. A great two trees there. I wonder if that's speaking of. The two prophets. Is this uh what is it speaking about when it says I saw these trees and great two trees? Um you'll see that these trees are existing today. They are standing on the shores and casting their nets, right? Making the water of the river go into the ocean, which is the nations, and making that water clean again. These right. trees are the 153 fish that the Messiah caught in his net, right? The 153 trees that stand up right in the end of days before the Messiah comes. When they are done, the two prophets make their appearance. These two prophets. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was wondering if that's what that was great. The great two trees was speaking of the two prophets. All right. Um, okay. Let's see. That tree in its height uh, was like the fir and the leaves are like those of the carob tree in its fruit, um, is like the clusters of the vine, very beautiful, and the fragrance of the trees uh, penetrates afar. Then I said, how beautiful is the tree and how attractive is its look? Then Raphael, one of the holy angels who was with me, answered me and said, this is the tree of wisdom, of which thy father, old in years, and thy aged mother, who were before thee, have eaten, and they learned wisdom, and their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they were driven out of the garden. Okay, so now it's talking about this one tree in the midst of all the trees, right? And this one tree is the one they ate in the garden uh, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9 and 3, verse 6. Okay, hmm. sorry, we've got a hand up here. Oh, uh, go ahead. Uh, if you got, a, if you have questions, um, I'm glad you're seeing everything because I'm not. I 
I got my phone is set up behind my uh, computer screen so that the I had distance between me and the phone and I can't see it very well. Sorry, guys. Can you? I, I see. Can you? Okay. I see. Emmanuel is hands. asking about the hundred and fifty-three fish. What do you mean, one hundred and fifty-three people? Yeah. So, um, you want you want to answer that, Jason, or do you want me to? Um, you can answer so long. I'm just looking um, for the verse quickly. Yeah, I mean, I was. I don't know how far in depth you want to go with with it because we were talking about when Peter was casting his net. Um, he catches the hundred and fifty three, which represent the hundred and forty four thousand. But then they also threw some of the fish back, right? Yes, they separate the sheep sheep from the goats. That's why it says go into all nations and preach the gospel. Right. Okay. I'm just trying to find it. It's in one of my teachings also. No problem. Uh, that's it's it's all right if, you, if people have questions. We just don't want uh, we don't want to move too quickly. That's why we're uh, that's why we're stopping so we can answer it. It's not a problem. And again, we're going to, um, you know, we'll be able to do okay. like a Q&A after maybe. We'll see. Let's just go to go to Matthew chapter 13, verse 47 to 50. Now, the topic is the book of, you know. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into the vessels and cast away the bad. So shall it be in the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and stir and, uh, and sever the wicked from amongst the just and shall cast them into a furnace of fire and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay, so this net is cast out and it catches fish. Is the kingdom of heaven, but while it's catching, I think it's somewhere where you are. The Messiah w wakes up early in the morning and he sees some of the disciples fishing and he tells them, Cast your net to the other side, and they start casting it to the Gentiles as well, the lost sheep. And they right. catch, a, catch a great multitude of fish. Um, I think it's 153 or 152 fish. These are the tall trees that are standing up today. They appear before the two prophets come. They are preparing the way that's acting in the spirit of Elijah. Right? They're wielding the sword. Mighty men, if I can call them like that. People like Adrian and all of these other guys. They are doing it as we speak. That's what's referencing the hundred. So if you want to understand what these tall trees are, they're standing on the banks. They have meaning they are not in the waters. They have separated themselves from the earth. And they are casting their nets into the nations and catching fish. And the, the fish that they are catching go flow into the ocean, which is also nations, the whole earth. And it makes the seawater clean again. Let's quickly go read about that in Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 10 to 12. Okay, it says, And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand up from En, en Gedi and to En Anglium, and they shall place to spread their nets, and the fish shall be according to their kinds, and the fish of the great sea exceedingly many. But the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. Verse 12. Uh, and by the river upon the bank thereof on the side and on that side shall grow all the trees for meat whose leaves shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to its months, because their waters they issued out of their sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Okay, it's healing. If you see someone preaching the true gospel and that you must be obedient to the law, they are separated from this this world. They are standing on the side of the nations. They're not part of them. And they are preaching a good thing. Want to get rid of the curses? Break them. Get baptized. Keep the commandments. Keep the law. Salvation, the example of the Messiah. 
this is what it's talking about. It's for prophetic speech. And they will cast their nets and catch a great multitude of fish, right? And once they catch this multitude of fish, they are separated by their own kinds. The good and the bad, the sheep and the goats, the thorns and the thistles, they are separated. And their gospel or their message is the same one of the Messiah. They have the witness of the Messiah. They are preaching truth. And this truth that they are preaching are healing people and people are coming to the knowledge of the truth. And we are waking up. And once this happens, we can see the coming of the Son of Man. Hallelujah. Not wait. Okay. So just for those who don't know, just go look up the word, word there, Angeli and Angliam. Very important to know. If you go look it up, you'll see what we mean. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where were we in Enoch? Um... We were in 32, and I was I had just stopped at 4th with uh, We me. finished 32. We, we are 33 now. Okay. For uh, chapter 33, and from thence I went to the ends of the earth and saw their great beasts, each different from another, and I saw birds also differing in appearance. And... Beauty and voice of one differing from another. Carry on. And to the east of those beasts, I saw the end of the earth whereon the earth rests, and the portals of heaven were opened. And I saw how the stars of heaven come forth, and I continued to the portals out from which where they proceed, and wrote down all of their outlets of each individual star by itself according to the number of their names their courses their positions and their times of their months as uriel the holy angel was with me and showed me so here you see that each star has a name and a purpose because stars were giving given for us for signs and seasons if it's time for a certain thing to happen yahweh might tell the angels right let a third of the stars fall down to heaven. Let the bottomless pit open. They open the bottomless pit. So mm. this, this is what you're seeing playing here. He's now describing the workings of heaven. People won't like this part because it confirms flat earth, but it is mm -hmm. what it is. I thought I was smiling. Okay. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Um... All right, chapter 34. And from thence I went towards the north to the ends of the earth, and I saw there a great and glorious device at the ends of the whole earth. And there I saw three portals of heaven open in heaven. Through each of them proceeded north winds. When they blow, there is cold, hail frost, snow, dew, and rain. Carry on. And out of the portal they blow for good, but when they blow through the other two portals, it is for violence and affliction on the earth, and they blow with violence. So you'll see north, south, east, and west. North has three portals, south, south, south has three portals, east and west each have three portals. And depending on which portal is open, it's either for a blessing and a curse. Now, it will bring to mind the scripture that says, I will give rain on a season for a blessing or a curse. It's either mm -hmm. for a blessing or a curse, depending on what portal is open. If you've sinned against the earth and you don't keep the Sabbath, mostly it will be for a curse. It will, it will create havoc. If it's for a blessing, the land will drink it up and the trees will bloom and flower. Amen. Um, let's see. All right. Is that, uh, you want to, should we go to chapter 36 and stop? Or is there a specific spot you want to stop? Um, just, I think we must still do chapter 35. But I'm, I'm, I was saying in general, like, I, yeah, I want to read 35, but um, do you want, is there a specific place you think would be a good stopping point? We can stop at 36. That's fine. Then it might have been an hour. So it's not too okay. long. Yeah. All right. It says, and from thence I went towards the west to the ends of the earth, and I saw there three portals of heaven open, such as I had not seen in the east. 
the same number of portals and the same number of outlets. Uh, okay. So yeah, this is a fragment. So so it's not um the whole chapter. It's just giving you a fragment. But yet then explains there's also three portals in the other place. So imagine this north, south, east, west, and you've got portals, three, 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 three portals. Right? Right. Okay, uh, chapter 36. And from thence, I went to the south, to the ends of the earth, and I saw there three open portals of the heaven, and thence there came dew, rain, and wind. And from thence... I went to the east at the ends of the of the heaven, and I saw there three eastern portals of the heaven open and small portals above them. Though each of these small portals pass the stars of heaven and run their course to the west on the path which is shown to them, and as often as I saw, I blessed always the Lord of glory, and I continue to bless the Lord of glory, who was who has wrought great in his glory, glorious wonders to show the greatness of his work to the angels and to the spirits and to the men that they might praise him in his work in all of his creation, that they might see the work of his might and the praise and praise the great work of his hands and bless him forever. Imagine we will be able, we were able to see this now and understand this now. Then you'll realize why Enoch is falling down and say, bless are you forever. For if man could have seen this, there would be no doubt. Because he is seeing the portals and the stars and how it works. If some portals open, it's called blessing rain. And if some some of the same portals open, the third or second one, it's for curse. These portals, for example, when the earth was flooded, portals opened in heaven, the portals for curse, and it was a flooding to destroy it. If the, the let's say that was the third port, portal on the east, but if the first one opened, it was for a blessing. It was raining right. on, on its time in its season. Just go to just for example the portals. Genesis eight verse two. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of the heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. That fountain or the window of the heaven is the portal. It was closed, and then the Rain that was sent for a curse to destroy was stopped. So obviously that window had to be opened when it started, right? Yeah. Genesis 7 verse 11. Job speaks about it, this, a lot of this as well. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Again, speaking about the windows, this Enoch is just giving you the description of the windows in way more detail. Yeah. I would do like Job chapter 38 speaks about it quite often. But you see it in Genesis. How would they know about the windows? They weren't taken up into heaven. Only Enoch was. They had the book of Enoch. That's why they mention it like they do. But Enoch saw it. And Enoch said, when I saw this, I fell to my knees and I praised and I worshipped the ancient of days forever and ever. For if man could see this, they would be fearing and trembling because it's made so perfect. This is why the Messiah said, if I tell you about earthly things and you can't believe, how would you believe if I was telling you about heavenly things, things that yeah. the Messiah knew? Because you'll see later in Enoch, he speaks about the Messiah that's standing there. He sees him. He sees someone like the Son of Man standing close to the Most High. Right? Absolutely. So, yeah, in Genesis, you see them talk about the windows. You want to translate those windows of heaven correctly, it's the portals. There are three portals on each side, north, south, east, west, three portals. If the first one opens, it's a blessing. If the second one opens, it's heavy rain. And the third one opens, it's for a curse. Now bring to mind again the scripture that says, I don't know where it's written, but it's written. I give rain on its season, either on the just and the unjust for a blessing or a curse. Right? So this is what it's talking about. If we pollute the land and we don't keep the Sabbath and we transgress against the earth because we're sinning against the earth by not keeping the Sabbath, God says, I will either withhold rain so you don't get rain on your season or I'll give you so much that you, you can't do anything. You can't plant. Anything will drown. Right? Yeah. And you wonder why the hurricanes and all of these things happen today and why total islands get wiped out and why flooding happens. People have become unrighteous, lawless. They are sinning against the earth, and the earth is witnessing against them. 